Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series. Facilitated by renowned educators, ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.ise.com slash podcasts. Please be sure to listen to our important message following this episode regarding the risks of investing in exchange-traded options. Uh, how often, Robert says, how often will the ETF be rebalanced, Mark? And I'll go through these questions. So, sure. One one. Um, depending on, uh, we, we have generally a uh, semi-annual re rebalance cycle for, for our, uh, in, our indexes. Uh, with the exception that any of our indexes that are equal weight, like FUM, uh, are rebalanced quarterly. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, I know, Mark, you're working on many different ideas, a lot of which you cannot divulge, but what about a, uh, Robert also has a question about Brent crude ETF. Um, uh, any idea on that? I don't, and again, I'm not certain if you can divulge that or not. Yeah. Um, I think anything, anything that we would do, I don't know that we would look at something that's directly uh, on that. I mean, we, we um, that is that that is directly on the uh, commodity. We would probably look at something around that. So, you know, look at some kind of maybe pair trade or or, or something like uh, that would would be the kind of thing that uh, that uh, we would pursue. You know, I mean, uh, you know, one of the things which is. It's it's great uh, being an index shop because you get to come up with all these great ideas and and you're 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 right there are plenty of stuff that you know I could tell you but I have to kill you and all that business but uh, <laughs> but but the uh, uh, but sometimes it's hard because you know we can come up with great ideas um, and sometimes issuers that's not where their headspace is um, and so sometimes it can be tough even though you have these 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 good ideas you know. Uh, that's a nice segue, Mark. Uh, another question from Robert. What causes ETFs to close? Uh, basically, they become unprofitable. Uh, I mean, in a very, you know, uh, to, to be blunt about it. Um, uh, you know, depending on uh, how big the issuer is, what, what, what current assets they, they have, um, a lot of times, uh, frankly, it's, it's, um, it's house cleaning. Um, you know, if you look at, I think uh, this past Q4, uh, PowerShares closed, I don't know, a dozen or 14 funds. And when you look at them all, you know, some of them actually look like not bad ideas. But then when you look at the assets that are in them, uh, you know, 7 million, 5 million, I think the largest one they closed was like 14 or 15 million. Um, even though they're a big shop and they, ha and they can essentially kind of rely on some of their larger funds to carry some of the smaller ones, uh, from a P&L perspective, um, you know, there comes a time where, okay, I have a $60 billion, you know, Q's product. Um, I don't do, do I really have time to take care of a dozen $5 million products? What about my salespeople? Do they, are they really going to spend time to sell those? You know, all these, all these kinds of things. Uh, so, so gen generally it's going to be, is, is, is the fund, and instead of saying profitable, I'll say, is it successful? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, which is a little, you know, it's a little more palatable, I guess, for uh, some people. Um, some, some, sometimes there's weird stuff that happens. Uh, last year, uh, with the acquisition of Claymore, uh, Guggenheim acquired Claymore. Uh, per per regulation, they had to have a shareholder vote uh, to approve the new issuer because technically they were changing the name. Claymore was going away. It is gone away now. Everything is Guggenheim. Well. What happened with uh, the Claymore Shipping Fund is they didn't have enough investor uh, response to even have a quorum to have to 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 have the vote. So the fund de facto had to close. They didn't mm -hmm. want to close yeah. it, and actually a lot of investors who were in the fund said, "Oh, why is it closing?" Well, what ended up happening is that they reissued the fund a couple months later. But essentially, on like an administrative glitch, um, the fund <laughs> the fund had to liquidate per the you know per the you know investment manager ownership rules. So generally, yeah, it's the fund is not quote successful. 
uh, Reed didn't get a bunch of money and 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 be successful from a P&L perspective. Uh, but then other times, you know, as they say, stuff happens. Uh, so very interesting. All right, that's very interesting, Mark. I didn't even know that. Uh, William has a question about uh, books. Are there other books? He says Gary Smith. He 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 likes Gary Smith and, uh, uh -huh. regarding ETFs. Are there other authors that are you could recommend for ETFs? Um, not a. Let me see. Uh, he's not really an ETF book, but it's an index book, which is pretty interesting. Stephen okay. Schoenfeld. Um, uh, you may uh, those of you who've been following ETFs may may recognize his name from um, uh, from Northern Trust, um, and he wrote a book uh, some some time ago, which actually was the genesis of the Index Universe website. Um, but that that is that is a very good book. It's pretty thick, <laughs> but um, it's actually not a not a bad read. Um, and, 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 Fortunately, a lot of what I'm reading is not necessarily books on the on the industry, but you know, kind of articles as as they come out and, and things like that. So, so I'm sorry, I'm not uh, I'm not the best uh, source for for That's that. Okay, Mark. What about this one? Uh, Robert also has another question. Yeah, Robert's had a lot of excellent questions. Can you use ETFs like a VIX option for portfolio protection? Um, I think that's your whole idea, Mark, is that uh, you and uh, the team at the IEC try to create products that are usable. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I mean, um, you know, one of the, I would say, Steve, actually, this uh, this kind of more, not that I'm pushing off a question to you, but, um, you know, honestly, the best, the best portfolio uh, protection that I can think of is, you know, a put. Um, so if you're already investing in ETFs, um, then you know, pretty much all of them uh, have listed options on them. Uh, and if so you don't wanted, overthink this situation. That's what I try to say, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can do all kinds of correlation studies and all kinds of right. stuff. Right. Uh, but honestly, the best way to hedge yourself is you know go out and find that put, uh, find out what you think you know uh, is going to. I mean, th there was. Um, there's a stock uh, that I bought last summer, and I looked at it the other day. I noticed it had a pretty, a pretty nice gain, and I, and I don't want to sell it because I do think there's still more upside to it. But at the same time, I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know, uh, you know, what's going to happen if there's a broad market event. This is definitely going to get uh, impacted. Uh, so I, you know, did some research. I, I found, uh, I figured out what kind of a two and a half to three standard deviation move would be in this in this name. Um, and I, I picked up a, uh, I, I, I picked up a put on it. It was super cheap, um, still above my cost, uh, and I put it on. You know, that makes a lot of sense, Mark. I, I try to remind people that you know sometimes you can really overthink the situation, looking at correlations. When, as Mark said, sometimes, especially in the market we're in now, where the volatility is, uh, the implied volatility is very, very low. Um, whether we're right, whether the sellers of the options are right, who knows. But if you want some insurance, um, maybe that's the best way to play it. It's just simply buying a put option. Yeah, yeah, and and, and it, it or or, um, yeah, yeah. It uh, could it it could be that, and it doesn't even necessarily need to be exactly on what you own. Um, you know, if you think vol is going to spike, generally, um, maybe maybe that's an SPY. You know, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something really that turns more into a volatility play than a protection play. And and again, I, Steve would probably spend much more time and be much better to talk about stuff like that than I. So. Here's another one, um, and I'm just going to read this verbatim. Uh, sure. So uh, I hope it makes sense. What are the requirements for the member stocks of an ETF? Do they have to buy the other company stocks? Uh, does each member stock have to provide investor information to the ETF manager? What are the requirements of the ETF manager to the member stock companies? Um, well, there, 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 there really is no obligation um, to, you know, from the, uh, there really is no obligation by the investment manager to the company or vice versa. Um, you know, when, when, when I'm putting together an equity index, uh, two things I'm looking for is, 
can can this company uh, handle really uh, heavy trading? Um, what kind of what's the market cap? What's the ADV of it? Um, if if I have a fund that is successful and does get to a uh, billion to three billion dollars, even though that company may be a tiny part of it, uh, say one percent of it, you know, if I have fifty million dollars a day flowing through the fund, what's that going to do? Is that going to blow out that that stock? Um, so those are those are things that I really look for. Certainly, uh, anything that's going to be listed uh, is going to be compliant with you know SEC reporting rules. Uh, and you know reg FD and all that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, again, this is this is an area where it's not too it's not too different from mutual funds or or, or really any any other kind of a, a portfolio. Um, you know, they certainly again due to reg FD. You know, operating companies don't owe any manager anything more or less than they owe the rest of the world. Um, so no, there's no real obligation. There's no quid pro quo or anything like yeah. like that. This one is uh, a little controversial, Mark, so get ready for it. Okay. Um, I think you and I have talked about this. Uh, uh -huh. the, the, well, I think it's a myth, uh, the myth that indexes and ETFs cause the flash crash in, in May. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I, I mean, I uh, personally, and, and, and Steve, you know, I mean, as a former market maker yourself, you, you may take a, offense to, to my position, but... but I personally think that all that that showed us was that there are a lot of market makers out there that whose models uh, don't work. Um, and instead of uh, truly having a pricing model based on company fundamentals and certainly paying attention to other correlations in the marketplace, uh, I, I, I think anyway um, that, that what we saw on May 6th was um, a lot of emperors walking down the street with no clothes on, um, and you know, again, Steve, you and I like, like, like you said, we've 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 talked about this, uh, a, you know, a little, and I just think that there were a lot of market makers out there that said, well, over time, this correlates to that, and that correlates to this, and this correlates to that, uh, and so they set up these these models that are. Uh, well, really fundamentally flawed in that they almost lose sight of what are the fundamentals of this company? You know, what do they do and how does that factor into what the value is? Whether it's a dividend, whether it's cash flows, whether it's the uh, state of their industry, whatever it is. So, I mean, I, 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 I kind of, uh, that's that's where I'm coming from on that. Uh, but, but in terms of ETFs causing anything, um, I mean, supposedly it was uh, it was an E-mini uh, SPX future, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, Mark. It's hard, you know. And, and, and as you said, I'm a former market maker, but I, I can't disagree with you that uh, the moss. Obviously, many market makers had models that they were, uh, I guess, their foundations were flawed. Obviously, and so um, a couple market makers are probably doing fine. In fact, many of them probably were. And, but yeah. all, you, all it takes is a couple to um, drive prices to ridiculous prices because there wasn't a lot of liquidity and that scares everybody else. But that gives us all an opportunity to trade, so we shouldn't be afraid of this. Uh, there'll be some other event that we really can't predict that will occur, but uh, as Mark said, there are put options out there in a lot of ways. Well, um, one or two last points, and uh, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i handle this, Mark, and then you can just chime in. Um, sure. question from Jose. He says, FCG has been an uptrend since August do you and I uh, foresee a reversal in direction anytime soon? And I'll jump on this first, but uh, maybe if Mark has a really good clue on it, then I'll have to ask him in the office if I know um, when it might uh, reverse. <laughs> Mark, tell me, please. It's tough, no, right? Um, I mean, uh, uh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, um, you know, honestly, I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm just going to put on my, my technician's hat here for, for a little bit. Um, you know, I mean, when you look at what natural gas has been doing, um, it really, it seems to almost kind of, kind of bottomed uh, through, through the end of Q4. Um, 
you know, when I'm looking back earlier in the year, I see natural gas at like a, like close to a seven handle. We're at, it's at like 440 now. So, I mean, if you go back even further in time, you know, it was trading higher. It was trading much, much higher. So, uh, you know, uh, depending on your outlook, yeah, I mean, I got a peak here back in 08 of around 12. Right. Um, so, you know, never say never, and certainly, uh, you know, this is not a forum for advice, uh, but purely from a technical perspective, it does like it does look like natural gas is starting to come off the bottom. Right. Which is so. interesting. <laughs> that means FCG could go higher, then correct? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no reason <laughs> for it not to. I mean, you know. Uh, Mark, one last question, um, and I don't know the answer to this, but a uh, great question about: Do you know what the beta is? Even if you can approximate it, the beta of FCG versus uh, the Standard and Poor's. 500, do you know, is it in line there at one? I don't know the answer to that. Um, well, let me let me see something here. Um, see if you can. I, I just don't have that information. And Tina, yeah, um, I think it was Tina asked that question. I, I just okay. I don't know. But I like the reference to FCG. It's very interesting, as you pointed out, that spots starting to move up. A lot of interest in FCG. Yeah. Um, let's see. And, of course, Fume, the index. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Let me just uh, pull this in here. Sorry, bear bear with me. It's Steve. okay. We appreciate it, Mark. If you can get it, that's awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if I look at if I look at the correlation between FUM and SPY, mm -hmm. and I do this daily over the last calendar year. Mm -hmm. um, it, it says here that it has a 0.877 correlation SPY. Wow. Um, so it is highly correlated to SPY. Wow. Um, but in terms of a beta, oh, here we go, here we go. Uh, Mr. Bloomberg knows uh, his stuff. Yeah, it basically uh, it says here that it has a beta of 0.54. Wow. So it's a lot less. That's interesting. And yeah. you know what? Here's another question from Kirk. He says, are the correlations between ETFs readily available? Is there any place that uh, the listeners can go for free, or do they have to subscribe to Bloomberg? Um, you know, that is a good question. Uh, you and I have to find out the answer to that. Yeah. I, I, I know that when you go to sites like uh, Google Finance and Yahoo Finance, they usually have tables of competitor products. I don't mm -hmm. know if correlation is one of those matrices that they that they put up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that yeah, I unfortunately I don't I, I don't have a ready answer for that. Sorry. That's fine. Hey, Mark, I think it's time we got to wrap it up. So what I'd like okay. to do is let you have some closing comments. So I'll have some closing comments, and then we'll uh, we'll see each other again tomorrow. And uh, hopefully sure. we'll see everyone back next uh, Wednesday, because Tuesday I'm traveling, doing another ETF. Uh, well, I'm actually doing an OIC ETF presentation, a live event, but next Wednesday I'll be back doing another presentation. So, Mark, why don't you take it away? Sure. Um, you know, again, I uh, want to thank all of you for uh, joining us. Uh, as Steve said, this is this is the first of our series covering uh, you know kind of the uh, index and ETF space. And I know a lot of you are used to hearing Steve on the uh, on the FX side. Uh, very pleased that you all could make it and all stuck around. Some good questions. I like the interaction. Um, you know, again, uh, ISE we do indexes too. Uh, currently, we have about 25 indexes. Uh, eight of them have been licensed out for use with ETFs. Uh, in fact, just today we crossed uh, $1.1 billion uh, of assets tied to those indexes with ETFs. Um, if you want to learn more about the ETFs, uh, you can go to our website, isc.com slash index, uh, and you can get facts about the indexes, and then there's also some links there. Uh, to our partner sites, uh, First Trust Advisors and Direxium Funds. So again, thanks a lot for coming out. And uh, Steve, I'll, I'll give you the final uh, say there. Mark, thanks.
uh, I found this to be, well, first it was informative for me because I learned a couple new things. So thanks because you have a wealth of information. I'm getting some great comments back. So thanks again. I know uh, it, you took uh, another hour and a half, two hours out of your busy day. So thanks for helping us, Mark. Really appreciate it. Help me at the education level here at the ISC because, uh, Mark, I know you, you are responsible for the uh, sort of building these products, uh, the indexes and, and um, licensing at the ETS. So thanks again. Really appreciate it. Sure, no problem. Just want to remind everyone, first of all, thanks again to Mark Absey. Uh, he did a great job um, just educating all of us on uh, indexes and ETFs, and there's more to come. This is the first of many, so next week I'll be talking about ETF options. So if you hopefully you know a bit about options, it might be a little uh, simplistic. However, um, I'm getting questions about that now. So um, you can use options with the use of ETFs. In fact, as Mark actually pointed out, sometimes it's just best to keep it simple. I, I have the same view on that. So that's going to be on January 26th, a Wednesday. So we're going to try to keep it a Tuesday most of the time. Next week I'm actually busy. I can't make it on a Tuesday. So next Wednesday, basic ETF options terminology. Um, but then the following week, February 1st, trading ETFs using the RMO trading methodology. I, um, I, gentleman from Thomson Reuters will be in, Jeffrey Gibby, and he'll be talking about uh, a methodology that he uses. And then uh, February 8th, uh, beyond buying whole options strategies for the diversified ETF investors. So there's lots coming. And again, we want to thank Mark Apsey. I want to thank all of you, the attendees, for joining us. On the behalf of the IAC, it's Steve Meisinger wishing you a safe and happy trading day tomorrow. Please join us again next week, next Wednesday, for the next ETF. Uh, presentation. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye now. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.